uh, we're um, the biggest hospital actually in, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have uh, around 760 beds, which is of course very small compared to the hospitals in Pakistan, but it's for United Arab Emirates is a very big hospital. And as Fatima so kindly pointed out, I have the fortune of being both a neurosurgeon and neurologist. I started in neurology and did a two years of residency and then I uh, the neurology department didn't work very well and I was asked to, to change into neurosurgery, which I accepted. And after my residency, I was asked to come back to the neurology department as a, the head of the department and, and um, fix the things that I fled to, uh, five years earlier. And um, 10 years after that, I got the position as chair of neurosurgery here at SSMC, which is a partnership uh, between Mayo Clinic and um, uh, uh, initially, the, the governmental uh, healthcare organization here in Abu Dhabi, Saha. Um, it's not one of these management arrangements that you can see every now and then that Johns Hopkins and, and other organizations, they, they manage a hospital for a few years. Mayo Clinic actually owns our shareholders in this hospital, so it's a joint ownership between Mayo Clinic and, and the government of Abu Dhabi. Um, I uh, this talk um, uh, I will in, um, start with a sort of you know a, a movie trailer introduction. So it's like from walk and talk to socio-cognitive mapping, the evolution of a discipline reflected in the journey of a team. I should do this with a more dramatic voice, I think, and the story of a patient. But you can also see it as a journey from the cold capital of Stockholm, Sweden to this beautiful city of Abu Dhabi, uh, a city built uh, on in the desert, um, but made very green, as you can see here. Uh, it was a big project from Sheikh Syed, who was the first president of the country to make the desert green. It was one of his slogans, and he was very successful. This is the only country in the world, only country in the world where the urbanization actually uh, increases uh, the, ma the green mass of the country. So it's uh, incredible to see here um, by, by, by a very devoted leadership. Awake neurosurgery, as most of you know, is not a new thing. It started already in the First World War by Furster. You can see him here together with Penfield, uh, so, sorry, with Tönnies and the Swedish uh, famous neurosurgeon Olive Krona. Uh, he operated soldiers during the war, for, uh, mainly for epilepsy. And th then, of course, Penfield, the, one of the greatest neurosurgeons ever. Uh, and in epilepsy surgery, of course, also, also Ogeman Sr. and Ogeman Jr. in Seattle. All these people were focused on, on doing awake surgery in epilepsy. Uh, in the 90s and, and early noughties, um, low-grade gliomas started to be a big thing in the wake epilepsy in, in awake surgery mitchell berger of course one of the most famous he is now actually the most cited neurosurgeon in history he has a h index that i will show later on how uh, often people uh, cite him in in, in uh, publications and then of course uh, the great uh, Hugues Dufault in montpierre in france uh, who has been awarded many awards, of course, for, for his work in exploring the uh, subcortical pathways uh, of the brain. And in Linköping in Sweden, we started in 2007. We we just like to point that out that we're on we're a part of this journey, but we're very local in Sweden, of course. Uh, you see here the H index is reflecting how often their publications are cited and you see Penfield has an H index of 62 which is very high Ogeman senior H index of 71 this is this means for you who are not acquainted with the H index that for instance Dufour with the H index of 100 it's a little bit higher now it means that he has 100 publications that have more than 100 citations he can have 300 uh, publications he has actually over a thousand but 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 a hundred of these have more than a hundred citations and uh, the great mitch berger he has 132 this is 132 is nobel prize uh, uh, levels actually of citations so the awake surgery is something very influential in 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 um, in your surgery um the lo last few decades I, I usually say this because when you have different talks about the wake surgery, there are always a few like old fashioned neurosurgeons. I will talk about them a little bit here. And we are, we 
who are more acquainted with awake surgery, we call them a little bit jokingly, we call them walk and talk surgeons, because this was what you did before. You, you checked for the, pa the patient could walk and talk after the surgery. You were very, very happy about that. You didn't care so much if they lost their job or if they couldn't, they couldn't understand who they were anymore. And, 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 and these very important, you know, functions of the brain. Uh, and the walk and talk surgeons, they usually think that you don't have to do so, uh, awake surgery in the right hemisphere, for instance, because they don't know that there is language in both hemispheres and that there are functions uh, which are very uh, frequently lateralized more to the right hemisphere that are very important. And I will um, show this through an example here. Why should you do intraoperative mapping, which is another word for, for I think, awake surgery in, in most um, uh, circumstances these days. You can, of course, do it to sleep, but um, uh, when we talk about it here, it's in, in awake surgery. Well, you want to, of course, obtain maximal resection with minimal deficits after the surgery. This is to, uh, to secure high quality of life, but we also know that the maximal resection will lead to a prolonged progress, progression free survival. And very importantly, gliomas are diffuse infiltrating, diffusely infiltrating the brain. So this is not the last tumor cell of the tumor where you can see it on the MRI. The flare signal in the MRI is only where the tumor cells are so concentrated in such high concentration that they actually give you a signal on the flare. Uh, so this is not the border of the tumor. The border of the tumor is diffuse. So in the middle of this uh, flare signal, there are a lot of tumor cells, but there are tumor cells also beyond the flare signal. So you have to look for the functional borders. You have to take out as much as you can with as great margin as you can to get as many, tr many tumor cells as possible. And the reason for you want to do, uh, the reason for, uh, for this is you want every tumor cell can become more malignant. They can malignify or uh, transition uh, to a more malignant um, uh, status. And to avoid that, you have to take out as many tumor cells as possible. Uh, there is an ongoing discussion, and Professor Dufour often speaks about supermaximal resection. If you can resect far beyond the flare signal, maybe you can take all the tumor cells. It has not really been proven scientifically, even though he claims that he's very close to do that, but, but not really. So we still need to take out as many tumor cells as possible. But we don't want to, to, um, to injure the patient and give the patient uh, a bad quality of life. So this is why we do it awake. Our Swedish team journey, I will start with this. And when I come to the end of this, I will then switch into what we do here in the multicultural setting, because Sweden is not a very multicultural country. It's a, uh, getting more multicultural, but it's, it's quite a homogenous country. 95% um, of the people in Sweden speak Swedish, which is easy when you're going to test patients for, for it's, it's not the first language for 95% of the people, but 95% of the people actually speak Swedish. We started in 2007, we did it full awake. We did non-structured speak te testing. We had the patient talking and reading, but we didn't have any structured tests. So we started like that and we, and we stimulated the brain. We, we used a technician or a nurse to do the testing. Actually, they were only talking to the patient more um, casual talk. And when the patient stopped talking, we said, okay, we're now close to the speech centers, uh, which was what we used to call them. We did motor monitoring, which is very easy to do. Uh, skin to skin, fully awake was six to eight hours. So this patient could be awake for eight hours, maybe 10 hours uh, during this surgery, fully awake. It was very, very tough on the patients. I, the patient I will talk about a little bit here is, is um, uh, his first experience was this. In 2010, we started using this most common method, the sleep awake sleep method, where you open the skull with the patients to sleep, and then you wake the patient up, uh, you do the testing, you, you resect the tumor, and then you put the patient to sleep again for the closing process. The faster you get, I think more and more people, uh, when you start doing this a lot, you, you skip the last sleep part because you're so fast, so it doesn't really affect the patient. You don't have to put them to sleep again. We started doing standardized speech testing, and we, we used a, 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 a version uh, adaptive version of the Boston naming test, which is basically an image uh, and you have to name the image. Uh, Dufour also introduced uh, uh, the importance of having a sentence, which is, this is 
So the patient has to read that sentence and then name the object because this gives you, this is a very simple test, but it gives you uh, also semantic, um, um, uh, you, can, you can differentiate between the ventral and the dorsal stream of the, of the speech network. We, used, we started to have site visits from the other university hospitals in Sweden uh, because we started doing this a couple of years ago when we talked a little bit about it. So they started to come to us to, to learn about this. This is how it looks. So I use, use, usually use um, monopolar um, probe and uh, stimulator. And this is because I'm used to that. Uh, I'm used to using that for, for distance um, um, distance stimulation when I come close to the white matter tracts, I know that one millimeter with this is um, equivalent to uh, one, one million pair with this is equivalent to one millimeter of tissue. So when I get I get stimulation, um, positive stimulation on 10 milli, uh, 10 million pair, I know I'm 10 millimeters from, from the subcortical pathways, um, like the speech or the motor pathways. I also always have you see the white electro there that's on the motor strip this is a tumor sort of splitting the motor strip a little bit so it's it's a little bit special in this case we usually do that continuously during the surgery and then the yellow one is eg i've never had any problems with seizures during surgery we had seizures of course but then no never any problems if you have ice cold water in an, in an ice bucket you just spray a little bit of ice cold water if you have a seizure if you have a generalized seizure, the brain will be um, swelling a little bit, but you just put, put your hand over it and it will it will be cool. Um, it, it's, it's a bit scary maybe the first time, but when you've done it a few times, it's you know what to do. Uh, this is something that also, often the old neurosurgeons are very scared of when they start doing neurosurgery, but it's uh, awake neurosurgery, but it's I've never encountered a problem with seizures. Um, then, of course, uh, around this time as well came this very famous publication from 2005 from, from Dufour, where he compared non-awake surgery with awake surgery and actually saw that the survival was much higher in the awake group. So this is Johnny, this is a patient. This was in 2010. He's, he was then a 47-year-old male. He had no previous medical history. He presented with a seizure, which, of course, is, a, is a quite a common presentation. Um, there were no preoperative notes from this occasion on his occupation, his family situation. There, were no, there was no neuropsychological testing. And the only thing we know from later is that he actually was a bank manager with 16 employees. This was his background, but this is not mentioned in the notes from, from 2010. This was my supervisor, Robert, this patient. He had this tumor. They actually did it awake because they wanted to avoid motor uh, deficits. Uh, and this was a fMRI, and you see the, the speech function, um, or the, the motor function was activated just um, cranial to the tumor. Uh, he was operated fully awake for eight hours. They did motor mapping, naming task with images, and they got quite a good result. There is some, as you see here in the post-operative, there is some tumor left, and this was because they got problems with a motor function. It was obviously not there, but, but they, they couldn't really interpret the, uh, the stimulation. Unfortunately, what they tried to avoid with awake surgery was hemiparesis. He got hemiparesis, and he was referred to rehab center, which was very good for him, because in the rehab center, they found out that he had impaired verbal memory and facial recognition, not in concordance with his professional position. So the psychologist testing him in the rehab center said he was, it is no chance that he could have been a bank manager with 16 employees having these deficits. Uh, so that they had to have come during the surgery. Three years of cognitive rehab, they didn't focus so much on the motor function, obviously, in the rehab center. They found this out and they started doing cognitive rehab. After three years, he was back at 50% capacity, but he was working as an assistant in the bank, not manager anymore. This was the level he could obtain after the first surgery. Before surgery, he was working as a bank manager. After, sur after surgery, he could not do that anymore because of his cognitive dysfunction. The hemiparesis is almost resolved totally. I followed this patient for many years and we will get back to him later. 
So our team journey continued in 2012. We started doing semantic speech testing. And you see here, we employed a psychologist doing the testing. We visited to four. In 2014, we published our first 48 cases. That was only regarding speech motor and resection grade, nothing about cognitive function. We had a nurse follow up testing the patients and it said that patients were doing well. We had done about maybe a hundred cases back then and only two patients said they couldn't do this again. We met with Dufour, Berger and Stummer and Samanduras in London and discussed awake surgery. We learned a lot. We visited Dufour again. 2015, we started to follow the patients up with a psychologist, the psychologist that we just employed here in this image, uh, Tom. And he found out, he followed 15 patients up and he found that they had significant cognitive cognitive deficits. These patients that we, we operated before when we only tested for, for motor and speech function. So it's obviously a problem that the, nor, the, the more common tests that we do during awake surgery do not capture the whole problem for the patient because these patients had significant cognitive deficits. None of these five patients, he followed 15 patients, none of these five patients could work anymore. And with the resection, we can double the life expectancy in these patients. So we are expecting them to live, if, if we didn't operate then they might live for five years and if we operate them, they might live uh, the old style, uh, asleep, they might live for 10 years. And if we operate them with awake surgery, as Dufour has shown, they might live 15 or 20 years. And for to have a good quality of life, there are some aspects to that, except for just naming objects and moving your limbs. And those uh, aspects might be recognizing your family, um, um, memory, and other functions. So we started by, from these results, we started doing more comprehensive cognitive testing during surgery. Um, we also published our cases, as you can see here. We, of course, when you publish, you take the most um, exceptional cases. This was the entire left frontal lobe, and this patient actually got back to work after this surgery. Um, what we have learned from from uh, from awake surgery, this is from Dufour, is that, of course, you see in the first image here, language is a quite widespread function. Dufour doesn't talk about Broca or Wernicke anymore, me neither so much. Uh, we talk about the frontal and temporal functions more. Uh, and uh, because Broca is more, that area is more related to, to motor function, but for, for speech production, it's not so important. Uh, that small area called Broca, it's more widespread in the, in the, in the frontal lobe and it's huge individual variation. Uh, also, we have learned a lot about plasticity in the brain from awake surgery. Uh, we have learned a lot about the ventral and dorsal pathways in language production. I won't go into that now in detail, but this is, of course, basic things to know if you're a neuro-oncology sur surgeon. You need to understand the difference between a ventral pathway injury and a dorsal pathway injury, because otherwise you don't know how to test them during surgery. What we do now is we do motor, fu motor function, phase reversal. This is different motor function tests. We do sensor function, SCCP. We do visual functions, visual evoked potentials, direct cortical and subcortical stimulation. Here you can see a patient we operated with direct cortical and subcortical stimulation awake for, for a, a, a Struge-Weber malformation in the occipital lobe. And we could save her lower quadrant, uh, which was the aim of the, of the mapping. Uh, sacrifice the upper quadrant because with the lower quadrant she can still drive a car and this patient this was an epilepsy patient she's since this is now six years ago still seizure free works 100 percent and can drive a car uh, when it comes to speech we do the naming task of course as everyone does this is a naming task this is in arabic of course uh, adapted to to the to the uh, testing we do here so they have to say the the sentence and then, then they have to name the object and if they miss a sentence we know it's more of a semantic uh, uh, problem and if, if they miss the object it's more of a um, uh, phonemic problem they can say if they say fen instead of pen that's a classical phonemic uh, mis a mistake if we stimulate so that's more with a um, uh, the dorsal stream uh, so, sorry ventral stream and association pyramid task, we do semantic function, phonemic function. Perception, line by section is a test you can use for perception, in the, especially in the right hemisphere. Uh, I won't go into detail in, because that's not the topic of today, but all these tests are very well tested to do during surgery and very easy to do if you know how to do them.
This is a line by section. So you see the patient is impaired on the on the in the B example. They they are not able to to um, uh, bisect this line in the middle. And this you can actually when you stimulate on the on the right side, uh, you can actually especially parietal. You can actually um, induce this in a patient, and you know that this if I start if I resect this part, it might be. I can cause a patient to um, a neglect. And continuing with our team journey, we started doing memory testing, more epilepsy patients in 2016. Uh, we started co to collaborate with Queen Square for white matter dissection, and we developed our own software for accuracy and latency in, in, the, in the responses for, from the patients. And in 2022, we reached 200 cases, which of, not, of course is not a huge series, but it's, it's uh, the biggest series in Sweden for awake surgery. This is uh, what we did uh, for for um, uh, mem mem um, uh, image memory or, or uh, spatial memory, visual spatial memory. So this is you see this first, and then you're exposed to these. And what did you see before? And we can do different. This is our own software. We can see differences during stimulation here on the top and with no stimulation on the bottom, you see there's a difference in, in recognizing these rec um, ex ex facial expressions. Uh, social cognition, here you have facial expressions, uh, you are supposed to, in this test, this is called reading the mind in the eyes, you're supposed to see what feeling is this, what, what emotion is this patient, is, is this, the, are these eyes expressing? We found that the eyes were very hard to use, so we started using the full face instead, this is actually the wife of, of our psychologist, so she's uh, she's in our in our software. He took photos of her in different emotional um, emotional situations. I don't know what he did to make her angry, but he he has a picture of her angry as well. Uh, and we also started testing short time memory. Digit span is the easiest one. You you can you uh, you 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 see a number of, of um, a series of of, of uh, digits, one two five nine seven, for instance. Uh, and you're supposed to remember this, and if you don't stimulate, you remember them. If you stimulate, you will not remember them. Working memory is a little bit more complicated because it takes some kind of manipulation of the data. So Digispan is just remembering, short-time memory is just remembering. Working memory is also manipulating the data a little bit, processing the data. We, we do this for visual-spatial, auto-verbal. We look at retrieval. Now we use here, we use a Mayo Clinic Neuromapper, which, where all this is integrated. This is David Sapsevich from Mayo Clinic Florida, a good friend of ours. Of ours. And, and um, here we can get all the latency numbers, accuracy, what will happen when I stimulate here. So we have everything saved, and this is a cloud-based function, so David can use all our data for his research as well. Back to Johnny, the patient. In 2021, he was 58 years old. He was still working 50% as a bank assistant in the bank where he used to be the manager. He was highly valued as a member of the team in the bank. The job was very socially important for him, but he still had his impaired verbal memory. This was image in 2010. This was image in 2021. 2020, 2010 is post-operative, 2021 was now. So obviously the tumor was growing. And uh, you see that blue dot there, this this is uh, the IFOF, inferior front, uh, frontal occipital fascicle of the right side. And if you've done your studies well, and you have read a lot from of, of the studies from Dufour, you know that even if this is on the right side, the right side, the right side IFOF is involved in verbal memory. So this was obviously what they injured in the first surgery without knowing it. So we did another surgery, sleep awake, uh, three hours it took this time, uh, and we did verbal memory mapping, spatial memory mapping, line by section because it was the right side. We did facial expression because the tumor also, you didn't see that in that image, but it was reaching the supramarginal gyrus on the right side, which is very important for facial expressions. Uh, and we could get the entire tumor out. This is a small, uh, small rim of tumor, maybe still there. Uh, and he is now, this was actually last year, and he is now back in his work again. He didn't need three years of rehab this time, and he's back 50% as, as an assistant still. And very happy about that. He wants to work until he's 65. He's now 58. So we, we made that possible with the testing. 
So interoperative mapping has contributed scientifically to we're not only valuing walk and talk as eloquent, there are other functions in the brain that are very important for the life, uh, life, uh, the quality of life. We know that we know now that the variability of cortical language organization is much more than Broca and Wernicke described over 150 years ago. Uh, we have a m much more understanding now of the subcortical pathways, the importance of these, and not only the cortex. We understand more about the interhemispheric integration and variability between individuals. For instance, language is now considered to be a bilateral function in all people. Uh, we have language function in both sides of the brain. It's just a matter of how good you're testing them. And also it's important to remember that on the cortex, it's probably more widespread in the right hemisphere, meaning that when we stimulate the cortex, we don't get an effect of the, of the language. But when we stimulate the, especially the converged parts of the subcortical pathways, we actually find language function in most patients on the right side. The dual stream model of language, the ventral and the dorsal stream, if you don't know about this and you're doing surgery, you should read about this before you continue your surgical journey in the brain. Uh, we know a lot more now about mentalization, you know, being aware of yourself, how that works in the brain. We know much more about social cognition, how, wh what parts of the brain will lead to you, you not knowing facial expressions anymore. I mean, the, in the bank manager, for instance, it's very important to know, to understand facial expressions. If you're going to, to evaluate if someone is credible enough to get a big loan, bank loan, for, for instance, if they're tricking you or not, it's very important to know facial expressions. Of course, very important for, for most people. We know a lot about, more about brain plasticity uh, through the studies done by people doing awake surgery. We know that this is not how the brain works. This is how the brain works. It's not a map, it's a network. Everybody knows this now who's working with this. And this was an editorial uh, from George Samanduras, a good friend of mine in, in, in London. And he was writing here now, extending, uh, it was uh, last year, extending testing for cognition has a wake brain mapping moved to the next level. What can we test in the brain and what is of importance to the different patients? So then I came to Abu Dhabi. United Arab Emirates is a country of 10 million people. This is the most international country in the world, represented by 200 nationalities, more than members in the UN, actually. Arabic is the official language. So when you come here, you think, OK, we can do a wake mapping in Arabic. But there are other languages that are uh, considered as semi-official, which you are, have the right to use in court, like Chinese. Chinese is not a language, but, but the Chinese languages. English, French, Hindi, and Russian. And also widely spoken. We have almost 3 million Pakistani living in this country. So Urdu, and we have a lot of Bangladesh people here, Bengali, Farsi, Ayam, and Turkish. These are huge languages in this country. So it's not only, you know, translating your tests into Arabic when you move here, you have to think differently. And there are other aspects to this that I will touch upon now. So is it as easy as that? We get a translator. Well, Defoe has showed that you can test 18 different languages by using a translator in the operating theater. I will oppose that a little bit now. He's a, I'm a great friend of mine, but I will oppose that a little bit in this talk. Um, there are also studies now on, on multilingualism in, in awake neurosurgery that the hemispheres are activated a little bit differently when you're multilingual. Most people in this country are multilingual, at least speaking English in another language, because English is um, almost like the official language here. But I will also talk now a little about, a bit about other things than just the formal differences in language, because it's not that easy. You cannot only translate the tests that you're used to using. There are, of course, language barriers that we don't speak the same language. It's harder for me to understand a patient who speaks Urdu than who speaks Swedish or English. There are differences in different kind of, kinds of languages. We call different things um, in different ways in different languages. I think the most famous example are the, 
the people in Greenland, they have like 21 words for snow. I can tell you there are not 21 words for snow in, here in, in Arabic, in Abu Dhabi, but there are many words for sand and sand, how sand moves and sandstorms. So depending on the language, one thing that has a name in one language might have many names in another language and many diff there are different kinds of snow. For someone from a country like this in, in UAE, there is only snow. But for me as a Swede, I know there are different kinds of snow, so I will name them differently. They have different words. And that's not really a language barrier. It's not that I don't know what snow is or I don't understand. It's, it's, there are different words for it. There are also this, and this is very important, there are cultural references that are different. Words that we use in one language that we think are very, very uh, apparent that you should know, you might not know from another language because you don't use that word. Um, or you, it has other connotations than it has in another language. There's also this in this country. There's huge different in educational level. We have everything from um, professors from universities to very simply educated laborers from all over the world coming here to work. This is also a challenge when you operate patients here. In Sweden, everyone has at least 12 years of schooling. A lot of people who work here do not have that. They haven't been to school at all, some of them. Also, to make things even more complicated, different brain, different languages seem to be represented differently in different language uh, in, in the brain. This is an, a very famous study from Edward Wang from 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 um, uh, University of California of San Francisco, where he, he, he's, he's divided. They are dividing languages into tonal and atonal and non-tonal languages. Where Mandarin is supposed to be a tonal language, and they have different representations in their brain, so we cannot use our old, old maps who are, have been developed in, in French and English and Swedish. There is something different. Some languages has a different way of functioning in the brain. These are all uh, images from the Boston naming test. I had one Bengali patient. He couldn't name one single thing here, and the, uh, the Bengali-speaking nurse who helped me, she said, "There are no words for these in." In, in Bengali. <laughs> so these were here totally useful, useless with this with this patient. I would say that maybe, maybe there was a word for pyramid, but he, he was very low educated, so he couldn't name, uh, he didn't know what a pyramid was. But in this patient, I couldn't use any of these. He didn't know what it was. So we have the mapping challenges. Naming a pyramid, if you, do, if you cannot say what a pyramid is when you look at an image, it could be because of aphasia. You can have a brain damage, a tumor, a stroke, uh, preventing your brain from saying the word pyramid. There can also be language differences. Different languages could have different words for this. I don't know in this case, I don't know if any language has more words than pyramids, but there, theoretically a language could have more, wor more words describing different kinds of pyramids. There are cultural references. Some May, may not know what a pyramid is because you have never encountered this in your culture. Um, and there might also be the reason uh, for, for not naming this a pyramid it might be because you have never educated, your, you're not educated. An educated Bengali patient would, be, would know what it is because it's not really a cultural thing, but an uneducated person from I'm taking the, uh, the example of Bangladesh. Now, it, I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't mean to be negative to Bangladesh. This was a, the patient I encountered, but this could be from from any country that you have a, an educational level that makes you not know what a pyramid is. And then, of course, the actual different representations make the mapping challenging. So you have to sort of find out why does this patient, why why does this patient don't know uh, why, why why what this is. Uh, and doing that, my, I have a pragmatic approach. I use the patient as his or her own control. So I, I do the test before the surgery. And if the patient cannot name these objects, I talk to the nurse who helps me to translate. Is this a word in your language? And she says, no, this is not a word. No one knows what this is in my language because we don't use it. There, there is a word, but no one knows what it is. For instance, in the, in the American um, uh, in Boston naming task, there is a unicorn. And in the Arabic culture, this is not a word. They don't use this. Uh, so it's a cultural, it's a cultural problem with a unicorn. 
but I can use the patient as a baseline. I do the test before the surgery. Okay, so I take out all the images that the patient cannot name for whatever reason it is. And I have to try to understand if it's a fascia, if it's a language cultural barrier, or if it's an ed educational barrier. But but I, I use the patient because the surgery is is supposed to be helping this individual patient and not some average American. It's supposed to help this individual patient for me to take out as much as possible from of the tumor without injuring the patient's function. So that's why we carefully select the task. So this is a pen. This is uh, actually a word that we have had no problem with any patient. And I use the, the sentence, uh, of course, in the language that the patient is, is speaking and the language we're testing to test for semantic function. Uh, semantic function. And we have to remember the aim of the surgery is max, maximal resection with minimal deficits. And we want to obtain a high quality of life and a prolonged life expectancy. But speaking with the words of Dufault, we have to individualize the testing to the patient. So if it's a, if it's a laborer here in the UAE, from let's say Sudan, who, who doesn't have a long educational uh, education, but has a very good work here as a laborer, a carpenter, for instance, maybe discussing the philosophical aspects of Plato is not very important for his quality of life. The important thing for him is he can communicate with his colleagues, with his, with his manager, and he can use his hands for the carpentry. Uh, so you have to individualize your surgery to the needs of the patient. If it's a, a Pakistani lawyer, for instance, um, a well-educated person, that person might need all the semantic functions that you can preserve to make it possible to st still practice law. And just showing you here, when you have a good team, this is a psychologist here in the, in the foreground and the nurse testing the patient. This is an Urdu speaking patient, actually a patient from Pakistan that we operated. And uh, when you have a very well-functioning team, you can see that the, the anesthesiologist is very relaxed. He's using his phone there in the background. And in this particular patient, we actually took out the frontal lobe, a big part of the frontal lobe. And the patient, this, this was also an interesting patient because he was, he was Pakistani, so we tested in, in Urdu. He was a carpenter here, but he was a teacher in Pakistan. He came here to make money as a carpenter. So he was very well educated. So you also have to think about your own prejudices. Okay, he's a carpenter, but he's very well educated. So we, had to, we tested him before, he knew all the words. Uh, so we could use our regular testing battery for him. Uh, and he wanted to have these functions preserved because he came here to make some money and then go back to Pakistan to work as a teacher again. His, his aim was not to work as a carpenter here. So you have to know your patient a little bit. And what to preserve? Okay, I have a general rule. I will sum up here now. My general rule for all patients, it doesn't matter if it's a Nobel Prize laureate or if it's a, a domestic helper here in the UAE. I think there are some things that are common for everyone in the entire world, okay? You want to keep your job. So you have to know what the patient's job is and what does it take to keep that job? Because without a job, you are lost, okay? You cannot make money. You cannot um, uh, support yourself and your family. If you have a house, you should be able to keep your house. And what I mean with that, you should be able to take care of your finances. You should have as much cognitive function as it takes to take care of your finances and your daily business. So if you can keep your job, keep your house, and I have a third thing that I think is very important, to keep your spouse as well. So your personality shouldn't change as much as uh, so much so that your spouse wants to leave you. So with these three aims of the function preservation, I think you can individualize the surgery to any patient in the world because these, th these three things are common human needs for everyone, wherever you're from, whatever your educational level, whatever your profession. And that's all of this talk. Thank you very much.